Welcome, everyone. I am Jill Crenty. I am the Deputy Superintendent of Curriculum and Instruction for the entire district. Uh, welcome to the Nukana Public Schools. It is delighted to see so many parents here this morning. Um, we're so appreciative to be able to offer this session to all of you who have incoming kindergartners. We're going to do a quick show of hands, though. How many, this is your first child coming to kindergarten? Wow. How many have a child already in elementary school? How many have one in middle school? How many have one in high school? All right. <laughs> and those high schoolers are ready to start their midterm exams today. So we're going from talking about the entrance into kindergarten to a high schooler who's have their first day of midterms. So we are uh, here to introduce some wonderful speakers today. It's a great opportunity to bring New Canaan Cares together with our elementary administrators as well as our curriculum coordinators. So today you'll have an opportunity to hear from Colleen Proster, who's the director of New Canaan Cares. You'll have the opportunity to hear from three administrators, Dr. Wallach, who is the principal here at East School, uh, Mrs. Robinson, who's the assistant principal over at South School, and Mrs. Gracia, who is on her way from West School, and she's the assistant principal over at West School. We have a few of our principals, unfortunately, who are out today, so we apologize that they're not available. Um, oh, and there's Mrs. Gracia walking in right now. Um, we also have a few of our coordinators here today who will be talking about ways that you can get your students, your children ready for um, kindergarten with the joy of reading and writing and mathematics. We have Kathy Grimes, who is our K-4 through reading coordinator, and we have Jen DePonte, who is our K-8 through math coordinator. Um, and then it's also important to introduce uh, Mrs. Reed. Mrs. Reed, Janet Reed, is the person who is in charge of all of our nurses. So she is a nurse at the high school, but she oversees all of our nurses, and she'll talk a little bit about some of the requirements and answer any questions that you might have about any medical needs of your children coming into kindergarten. We also have the data team here today. I know that Laura Walsh is our district registrar, and I think she'll be introduced later today, but it's always nice to put a face together with a name and somebody that you probably spend a lot of time talking on the phone with. Um, so she is the person that will help with all that registration. So without further ado, I am going to introduce Colleen Proster from New Canaan Cares to get our meeting started. So thank you. Thank you very much. all and it was fun to meet some of you as you were walking in. Um, Jill did say I am the executive director of New Canaan Cares, but first and foremost I am a parent here in New Canaan. Uh, I have two children that uh, I was sitting in these seats in uh, 2014 and 2015. So I have a freshman in high school and I have an eighth grader at Sachs. Uh, and this time has flown by. So when I say it is a moment in time, very fleeting, uh, it's very exciting. Kindergarten and elementary school is so much fun, so enjoy this time kind of leading up to it and you know, getting ready for it to start. Um, talking today just from a New Canaan Cares perspective, we are an independent nonprofit in town and we do a lot of programming for new parents' community. So just wanted to, I was going to take a Jill's line for it, right? Who's a first time parent and who's a seasoned veteran? And we saw kind of different hands go up. Uh, when I was a first time kindergarten parent, I always looked to that neighbor, that friend of mine who had already had this experience, and uh, you do learn a lot from them, right? They're going to calm your nerves. Hopefully, as you're being calmed today, they'll continue to help you with that journey. So remember those people and the one with the high schooler over there, right? They're going to let you know that. It's all going to be okay. The journey is beautiful. Enjoy the moment as it goes. Um, also, just remember to take a perspective step, right? It is a moment in time, and actually try to enjoy that moment in time, right? Be present in that. Um, our kids and your kids will be just fine. We'll hear later today from the administrators from the schools, the curriculum directors, um, elementary school. They know what they're doing. They're the masters of this, so it will be okay. It's 
Um, remember, try not to, to compare your child to others or siblings in your family, right? Every child arrives here uh, at a different age, at a different de developmental stage. I had a daughter who was not super baby that I sent. She was still actually four years old when she entered the school. And I had a son who was a May baby. So try not to compare. They're all at different developmental stages. Um, and yes, it's normal. It's normal for you and your child to have mixed feelings and emotions as we, uh, as you start out on this journey. And um, that's OK, right? It's OK to feel those feelings and then kind of get back on track. Um, another thing you guys can be thinking about as parents getting ready to send a kindergarten or school is preparing them for independence and things that you can do at home to start that journey now before uh, August. Um, you can recognize that the is, is declining, right? They're going to start becoming more independent individuals. Uh, you may already be doing this at home, but moving from doing things for your children to having them do it alone, right? So you do it for them, you have them watch you, you do it together, and then they do it on their own. So that's going to help in creating independence for them. Uh, expanding the range of choices at home, right? Giving them options. I'm sure a lot of you are already doing this. What are we going to wear today? You want to wear the blue shirt or the pink shirt, right? Uh, just having them create their own independence before they get started. Uh, small chores at home, right? We did a whole conversation uh, with you painting cares this fall about the importance of mattering. And it really starts with our little ones, right? Making them feel valued and them uh, doing things independently on their own uh, so they know their own value at home and as they go to school. Uh, and lastly, I think before they start, is creating those charts at home, establishing those AM and PM routines for them. It's going to be very helpful once they begin in kindergarten. Uh, your child's world, right? Once they get started. Kindergarten is a long day, right? And uh, school is a place that they can make it their own and they're here independently. Um, and you can help them support that. Um, I think it's remembering we all had our own journey back in the day when we started. So giving them that sense of you know, independence to make it their own, right? Um, I have a memory of kindergarten being a long day and not over scheduling your kids at the beginning of the year. They're going to come home really tired. Uh, we had an in here speaker who said, close your eyes and think about your child getting up, getting on the bus, arriving at school, doing the, you know, the rigors of the classwork, um, interacting with other kids. It's a long day, right? So especially at the beginning, try not to over schedule them, allow them to come home and kind of compress them. Um, and leave some unstructured time for play, right? They're going to be structured in their routines, both at home and school, um, but really important to kind of leave the time for that. Uh, and lastly, just new painting cares. I know there's a lot of new families to the district. Um, I just want to introduce new painting cares to a four year old organization. So we uh, have been around for a long time. We close as well with the new painting public schools. And we provide free parent and community programs. Uh, we have a joint PTC parent teacher uh, committee, elementary school, all coming up on February 13th, right here in the East School Valley. We'd love you guys to attend. Uh, and it's how to develop a love of literacy with your kids. And we have um, two lovely presenters from the Story Crafters coming in, talking about the importance of reading oral language and storytelling, and this is a parent conversation that you, know, you can learn a lot about the importance of that as they go into kindergarten. Uh, I think I'm leaving it over to Chris Ball now. Thank you. Uh, hopefully you've got a safe today for the upcoming weeks. I will stay around here at the end if you have any questions. Nice to meet you all. Hey, welcome, everyone. Thank you, Colleen, for handing, handing us over from preschool to kindergarten. We are always excited uh, to meet families who are coming to us for the first time and to see returning families and welcome you back with another kindergartner. Um, it's exciting. I know it feels like it's, it's maybe far off, but it will move along very quickly, and um, we're happy to, to have you along this, this journey over these next few months. I'm going to talk a little bit right now just about kindergartners, who they are, you are living with, soon to be kindergartners right now. Um, and what to expect about how they are growing. Um, 
and how our kindergarten program really is intended to support them in growing, not only in terms of those academic areas, where you talk about and writing and math, but really as a whole child. They're growing physically, they're growing emotionally, socially, and intellectually. Um, so understanding who they are as kindergartners is important, and we keep that in mind in all of our schools, and our kindergarten teachers are fabulous at meeting children just where they are. Um, you will see this in your preschooler right now, and as they're growing into kindergartners, they're physical um, development. And that's the gross motor as well as the fine motor. They are active, um, they're energetic, they're eager to explore the world, and they often do that physically, um, on the playground, in the classroom. Um, they may not have the attention span that you would hope they have, um, but they're growing that, and they're learning ways, uh, and learning what they're interested in, and ways to, um, you know, take in the world that's around them. They're excited, they're curious. Uh, they are developing that eye-hand coordination, and we continue to develop that here in our kindergarten classrooms. You see that in preschool classrooms as well. Um, some of those activities that might look like it's play um, from an adult lens, it is play for children, but it's also the work, it's the learning um, that is happening for them in those moments as they're, they're building that eye-hand coordination with the, the different activities that they might be doing. Um, and balance work, that they might be doing, whether that's on the playground or in the classroom, in preschools, in our kindergarten classrooms, work with uh, sort of that, that core part of their body. Um, that's also helping them to, to learn their place in space, understanding um, sort of personal space, understanding where their body is in relation to somebody else, and that's important as they're growing more and more to be living in a social world um, in their preschool and then here in kindergarten. They're still developing that right and left handedness. So parents will often ask, I think they're right handed, but now they're using their left hand for this. Should I be worried? It's developing. And we use that word developing to say this is a work in progress. So give your child time and, and, and be patient and let them continue to develop that over time. Similarly, um, interestingly, they're often far sighted, but they're learning to focus on material that's closer to them. So there are times where they're taking in the whole world and we're asking them more and more as they're moving through preschool and then into kindergarten to pay attention to something that's, that's right in front of them. So that's a book that we're reading together, um, whether that's some work that they're doing with crayons and pencils and and drawing work. Um, they're frequently reversing numbers and letters when they're doing that work. That is still very much typical at this time when they're in preschool and as they're moving into kindergarten. Um, so again, those are uh, tasks that we continue to work on in kindergarten and, and want you to give your child permission to keep developing those um, in those areas. And often they have difficulty waiting for their turn. And that can be in the physical realm, that can be social, that can be emotional. Talk about that with game playing, um, taking turns, helping them understand this happens first, then this at first, next is important too, and that can help with taking turns first. So and so is going to have a turn, then it will be your turn which leads us into the social emotional um, characteristics, ways that your child will continue to grow socially and emotionally. They want to please at this age. Sometimes their way of pleasing may not match exactly what would be pleasing to you, but they really are trying to be helpful. Um, it's just one story I had a kindergartner once who filled his backpack with water. I was thinking, I turned to him and said, what are you doing? And I said, well, I wanted to clean it. And so I'm washing. We took the backpack out to dump out the water. Uh, it would have been a great commercial for the backpack because it didn't leak. But you know, it was his intent to try to be helpful. I'm trying to clean my backpack. Um, and the way he thought about it was the sink has water. That's how I wash my hands. This is, this is making sense to me as a, at that time, five-year-old. So remember what might make sense to them. May not make sense to you right away, but ask them. Find out what they're thinking. They really do want to please. And then you can structure experiences for them to be able to help out. And then you can give them that praise. And that builds their sense of efficacy, their idea that they can contribute at home to set the table uh, to help you sort maybe the laundry, whatever you might need help with, or to help pack up their backpack to take to school. So what is in the backpack that we're going to bring? And that helps them to know what's in the backpack so that when they come to kindergarten, they know where their snack is or where their folder is. So those are things that if you make it manageable for them, they do want to succeed. They want to be successful, and we want to be able to help them take those small steps um, to be successful. They often think literally, just in my example there too, that that's sort of the world you're living in. They're very concrete.
very, very literal thinkers at this time. So just remember that. Some of those abstract concepts could be very challenging for them at this time. Um, and sometimes those emotions that they're demonstrating can seem extreme to us. Validate those emotions. They're still working on how to regulate them, how to understand why they're feeling what they're feeling. We do a lot of work in our district across the grades in terms of developing children's emotional intelligence. And you'll hear more about that when you're, you're in the schools. But we have tools and strategies that we use, and particularly with kindergartners, we're helping them just to label how it is that they're feeling. So that when they're experiencing a very strong feeling, a very strong emotion, they're very frustrated about something, we give them some language for that, under, help them understand it's okay to feel that way, so now what can you do about that? The feeling is, is real, the feeling is okay. It's that how do we respond? How do we react? What can we do in the situation? And how can we understand why we're feeling that way? Okay. So that's work that, that will be happening for your kindergartners to help them with those emotions. But expect that when you're that young, things do feel really big and help them to understand how to take what feels like a big problem and help to understand that maybe it's a small problem and we can work on this. Uh, they do need help keeping track of their belongings goes back to give them some small, simple responsibilities. Look, here's where this goes, here's where that goes. Um, and the more we can structure that for them and give them routines, I know Colleen talked about routines at home, that can help them to be able to keep track of those belongings. And then finally, the idea of intellectual curiosity that they have. Um, they are imaginative. They're still learning to follow directions. We work in the classroom to, to support that. The schools are doing that as well. They're opportunities to play, to be creative, but also to learn that there are some routines in the classroom. And there are times when you're working with a group of people that you come together and, and there are some types of rules as to how we have a discussion so that everyone gets a turn in that discussion. So it's really striking that balance um, for them in terms of giving them the opportunity to play and be creative, but also learn some, some of the, the ways to interact with others. Confusing fact and fantasy, sometimes just helping a child understand, is that really what happened or did you wish um, and also, but just understanding what might be real, real and what was real. Um, because sometimes that can be very, very uh, frightening for you to be confused about that. Um, beginning that cooperative play, and that's starting in preschool now. They're learning how to play with others, whether it's outside on the playground, whether it's at the play center's time in the, in the preschool. We have time um, in our classrooms where they are playing games, and those are often games that are supporting their learning. But it's also like those social skills. We do encourage families um, to think about having play dates with each other, with a neighbor, and with someone in preschool, um, because it does help them start to be a little more independent. They can go and they can play with a friend, they get that friend's house and you know, supervised play date, um, but it is an opportunity for them to keep practicing some of those social skills. They do like being read to. We're from Kathy Grimes, our reading coordinator, about how that reading out to children is so valuable that developing that oral language really does set the foundation for their literacy work. Um, and similarly, playing and in that oral language development, it's developing vocabulary, but it's also developing skills, um, understanding the sounds that are in words, how to play with those sounds, rhyming, um, thinking about words that begin with the letter B. Um, lots of different ways you can just play. And then learning from the world around the experiences all of you have with your children are very valuable. The way you are um, allowing them to just experience the world and have others to talk to about what they're seeing and thinking and wondering what they're doing, they're coming to us wondering and curious and eager to learn more. Um, I'm going to turn this over to Zoe Robinson from South School. As Zoe's coming over, I did just want to say, I forgot that in the opening, you see the pencils and the note cards on your chairs. So if at any time during the presentation you have questions, jot them down. If you want to put your contact information there as well, that's helpful because at the end we'll collect the cards. Um, we'll try to take some questions at the end, but that way if we don't get to your question, we can um, <coughs> you'll be able to reach out to you. Question that Good morning, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, as you enter this journey, just know that kindergartners always make a smile. Whenever I'm, I'm having a very busy day or just a rough day, I just walk into a kindergarten classroom and I assure you they make me laugh. They will say something, they will put a smile on my face. It's my happy place, I call it. 
So one thing that's probably on your mind is safety in school, and I want you to know it's one of our highest priority. Keeping our staff, our school, our students safe is of the utmost importance. And we have a lot of protocols in place to help with this. We have a district level CAT uh, committee that meets together to talk about bigger and broader protocols for our district. But we also have a committee at the school level, and we practice drills with our students. We practice fire drills, weather drills, all sorts of drills to help keep them safe. And kindergarten teachers do a great job about just practicing what do those drills look like. They take them on pre-practice drills before the drill. They have conversations with the students about just being good listeners. How do we line up? How do we listen to directions? And it's just a way to just, in case we needed to move about or just do anything, that they know what the expectations are. But our kindergarten teachers do a fantastic job about keeping it developmentally appropriate and just something that we practice in school. So please rest assured that more information will come up out about that, but we do practice these drills with them. Lunch and recess supervision. We Students have 30 minutes for lunch in kindergarten, and they do get a recess every day for 20 to 25 minutes, and there's supervision at all times. Sometimes there'll be teachers at the supervision, along with teaching assistants, but students are supervised. Kindergarten teachers do a great job visiting the cafeteria before their first entry into the first experience in there, and they take them out to the recess equipment before their first recess to talk about safe play and all the things that is expected of them. But they are supervised, and there's definitely people there to help them through. Do not worry, we will open milk cartons and, and orange juices if they need help. Just think about what you're packing for them to help limit some of the frustration, some of you know, the bento boxes, can they open it? That might be something you might want to practice with your child if you're going to be sending that in. It's always great to have those conversations with them. If they're buying school lunch, the staff does a great job. They take them to the cafeteria to visit the cafeteria. They practice walking through the lunch line prior to their first experiences of getting. So kindergarten teachers are well trained to get them ready and be prepared, but we also have a lot of staff to help them through, especially in the beginning. We have campus monitors at all of our schools. As you can notice, when you came in, there was a campus monitor. They gave you a sticker, and I love that all of you are wearing them. But um, when you're coming into the school to visit, you will be required to show your license every single time you enter the building. So even if you're familiar to our staff, we're still going to ask that you have that license. It's important. You will get a badge that we ask you to wear. You will see all staff wearing a school ID badge. We teach students and staff that Everyone should have a badge and everyone should be accounted for. So that is just a great help to us at the schools if you can help follow that protocol to ensure that we're keeping all students safe. How can you help? Have conversations with your child about it's okay, ask to ask you your questions if you're not sure of something. You can ask for help in the lunchroom if you need help with something. We're always there to help them, but just having conversations with them to help prepare them and ease their, their minds. You know, think about the questions you're asking. They're not great at telling you how their day was, so if you ask them how was your day, what did you do today, you might get nothing, or um, I don't remember. So think about more open-ended questions. What did you eat from the lunchroom today? You should know because you see the menu, so you should know if they actually ate that, and they'll be able to tell you. But just asking some more specific questions might help get you the answers, because I still get nothing from my children. <laughs> Health and wellness. Well, this is a great season to talk about that. Um, Kids get sick, and it's okay. We do try to teach them good, healthy habits. We teach them what proper hand washing is. Sometimes the nurses go into the kindergarten classroom to model good hand washing lessons. We, talk, we do have sanitizing stations, but they're gonna get sick. That's, that's what happens. So keep them home if they're not feeling well. If you have any questions about when should they return, the school nurse is a great asset. At the individual school place, kindergarten orientations, the school nurses will give a little bit more information about that. We do have food allergy policies. Um, we do not want students sharing food for a variety of reasons. However, if your child has an allergy, we will be working closely with the school nurse and all parties that need to know about proper protocols. But we do have students with food allergies often, so it's not nothing new to us, but obviously it might be new to you, so don't be afraid to ask the questions, and we will partner with you to make sure that you feel comfortable, your child feels comfortable, and we have all the protocols in place. 
facilities. We have air conditioning in our buildings. We have great ventilation systems in our buildings. So that's something we're very proud of that we've invested in over the years. Um, so it helps keep our comfortable springtime when it could be 40 degrees or 80 degrees, depending on the day. But we do have that as well. Safety on the bus. The bus is an interesting place. So um, rest assured that we do encourage your kindergartners to ride the bus. We work very hard to make sure that all the protocols are followed. All kindergarten students receive a bus tag with their bus number that's placed on their backpack. And we have lists and we have tons of adults making sure we're double checking that tag, we're double checking their name, that we're placing them on the right bus. So rest assured that they're less worried about riding the bus than you might be. So keep it positive with them, encourage them. We have a lot of staff to make sure if you have a question about the bus or the dismissal manager, you can always reach out to the school to get your questions answered. But it's something that we, we care about their safety. For that same reason is we sit kindergartners in the front few rows of the bus. Sometimes it's two, sometimes it's three, just depends on the bus and how many kindergartners are on the bus. But they're closer to the bus driver on the front of the bus. There needs to be an adult present for them to be left off the bus. So a sibling might not be able to just get them off the bus. It does have to be a parent or adult who will meet them at the bus stop to get them off the bus. If for some reason there is not, the bus driver will return them back to the school where the school will contact an adult to come pick them up. There are video cameras on the buses. And this, I love watching bus videos. Um, and I'm <laughs> like, Dude, what happened on the bus? I'm like, and then as soon as I say, oh, I looked at the video. Oh, now I remember, they tell me. So <laughs> it, it's always an interesting thing. But you know, it's just for the safety of everyone. So please rest assured that we do have cameras on the bus. Uh, multiple angles, you still can't see anything. A reminder that the buses don't have seatbelts. So what can you do as a parent? Just talk to them about safety on the bus that we sit on the bus appropriately, that we want to be able to listen to the bus driver in any directions the bus driver might have. But on that same note, we do training within our schools. We have the buses come to our school. Um, I know that Matt and I at South, we went over protocols and procedures with every grade level in our school, even the fourth graders can use that reminder. And we go over about behavior expectations and we run with the bus driver's bus evacuation drills. So we put all the students on the bus, they practice if there was an emergency, how do we get out of the bus? What are the, how do we listen to the bus driver? So these are all things that we do to make sure that we have all the protocols in place and the students are safe. And we have ongoing bus driving uh, training. Our bus drivers receive training. We do collaborate with them. If there's an issue on the bus, they will call us. We will be in communication and we partner with the parents if there ever is an issue to just kind of talk through it. But as always, you can always reach out if you have a specific question or if something is occurring and we will partner with you to make sure that it's successful. So what to do from now until the fall? Well, I'm gonna hand it back to Ms. Dr. Wallach to go through those slides, and uh, it will be a great experience for your kids, and we're so thrilled to have some. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about how you can get yourselves and your child ready. Um, there'll be some logistical information I'll share with regard to registration, but I'm first going to uh, hand this over to our curriculum coordinators because they are staff here that do an amazing job of really working with our teachers to think about the development and the design of our curriculum um, and the instruction that's occurring in our classrooms and they are so knowledgeable of how children learn uh, in those different content areas. So they're going to share some thoughts with you as to things that you can just be thinking about at home that help um, grow your child as they're getting ready for this journey in kindergarten. So, Kathy Grimes, our reading coordinator, is going to speak first. Good morning, and I'm also speaking for our writing coordinator who wasn't able to be with us today, Karen Scalzo. She's K-5 um, curriculum coordinator for writing. So you have pamphlets in your hand that you were given, and you'll have a reading one, a writing one, and one for math. And there's some good tips in these, so you keep them handy, and they'll also be posted on our website um, in case the paper goes missing. That'll be a good place to go for them. Um, so I just wanted to ask you, if you were asked, who are you as a reader, and who are you as a writer, what would you say? Just thinking to yourself, 
what would you say? Because teachers are asked this all of the time. We're asked this when we go to, you know, a workshop or something. Our children are asked this all of the time because this is what we do for them. We help develop them, their reading lives and their writing lives. And I would say that I'm a reader of uh, both genres of fiction and nonfiction, but I tend to go for the nonfiction. I love um, book talking. I love talking to children mostly about books, but I obviously enjoy my colleagues and my friends. Um, I carry books with me. There, I have probably several in my car. My writer's notebook is with me in my backpack every day to school. So this is something that we like to give language to. We like to give space for children to be able to develop this. And when you ask them, so who are you as a reader? That they're going to say what they like. What do they like in their reading? What do they like to write about? Um, where do they like to keep things? So um, there are some, just to remind you that uh, you've already heard it a couple of times, but you are your first and foremost teacher, your child's teacher and model. So when we say this number one tip to read aloud to your child each and every day, so you can be reading, um, which is a great model for them, but to read aloud to them, that is building so many foundational literacy skills, it's amazing. So I'm just gonna run through um, how many, like right off the, um, the most basics, I guess I should say, because there's so much more to it. Um, so learning to love language. They love to hear the way words come together, how words are used to explain and describe. Um, there's, this is well before they even know that, you know, what are those letters on the, on the page. But it is preparing them to make those connections between sounds and letters. Um, it stimulates their imagination and expands their understanding of the world around them. It brings them to new places. Um, you know, like the, a picture, when you do a picture walk with them, taking them through the pages from the beginning to the, to the middle to the end that you're using language and using very specific words and to explain what's happening in the story before they even get to um, the reading part of it. Um, it develops listening and conversational skills and those listening, I'm sure we can all appreciate that, is that when you do try to read a book from cover to cover, that they're listening to you and that's expanding their attention, right? So when you have their conversations with them about a book, you want them to be able to listen to you, just like they listen to the story, and they can be talking to you, um, asking and answering questions. Um, it also develops their sense of story. So it's like stories, there's a way stories go, and this helps them with their storytelling as well. There's a beginning, there's a middle, there's an end. And sometimes when a child tells you their story, you know, if you don't know where they are, you don't know who was in it, you don't know really what was happening to them. And so by modeling, telling story um, after story, you're giving them that place to start and then move into, was there a problem? Or maybe there wasn't a problem. Lots of kindergartners and first graders, they don't have problems in their stories. They have it's a really great time. But if you zoom into a moment, think of like a photo, that's what um, is really great to use to have them tell their story. So reading aloud and storytelling go hand in hand and it, um, it's developing their sense of how stories go, but also remember that we also read nonfiction. So it also will help them understand uh, more about a topic that they'll have like, here's the picture, here's the big idea, and here's some details about that um, topic that was being described to them. Um, there's also, this is um, reading aloud each and every day, will also help develop their comprehension skills on multiple levels, and also expressive reading, that when you're reading aloud, if you are using the character's voice, your child's going to practice that too. They're going to want to get up and act out that little scene from the book or sound like their character. It's very much like how they want to act out their movies, right? Sound like their characters from their movies. But if you change your voice, 
Um, even if it's not even in a character voice, you're doing the narration, and then you go, um, you know, like there's a mysterious part coming up, and you start going really low with your voice. They're, you're giving them a part to predict, to retell with you. Um, so it's a really good thing to get into the character's shoes, as they say. And then it also develops vocabulary. And just because we all love some good facts, I just have a um, number of words children have been exposed to by the time they're five years old. There's five groups of children that the research did. So children who have never been read to by the time they were five years old, they've been exposed to about 4,600 words. If a child's been read to once or twice a week, they, then this jumps considerably. They've been exposed to 63,000 words. Then three to five times a week, 170,000 words. And then if you're reading each and every day to your child, then they've been exposed to about 300,000 words by the time they're five years old. Then by the time they're five, they're also being able to um, use or understand, I guess you should say, understand about 10,000 words if you're reading to them each and every day. So that would be why you would want to read to your child all of the time. Um, tip number two is creating that routine and space. And I know that um, Chris had mentioned about how children really do, you know, they like a schedule, routines, and just thinking about always making sure that their books and their writer, writing tools are accessible. It's not like stuffed away, you know, that to go, it's a chore to go get. But you have a basket of favorite books, or maybe they have a bookshelf and they've um, put their favorite books in a place that they can always get them. Um, and then also we have librarians, most amazing librarians that we have one at each school and then you will, um, who are an integral part of your child's life. And you also have um, the New Canaan Library. We have 88% of New Canaan families have a library card. If not every child in the family, because that is a monumental moment. When you ask how many, um, if you go into a kindergarten class and you ask how many children have a library card, and honestly only a handful go up at the beginning, but you know, then they're asking, oh, take me to the library. There are so many amazing programs there, and it's just a fabulous place to be if you haven't checked it out yet. Um, and it's really easy to get a library card. Many of the teachers at Newton didn't have one. Um, I was going to say just one last thing about that is that when you go there, when um, there they have like all of their books are organized in such a way that it kind of mimics the way our classroom libraries are. So your children feel really comfortable finding their books because it's by topic, um, by size, by genre, uh, which is great. Um, tip three is chat it up and build that vocabulary. Always be thinking that there is an art to conversation. So it's really put down the device, no matter who has one in their hand. Look at each other. Um, build off of each other's um, stories. Or just practice conversation. And know that there's like, I always love the analogy of volleying the ball. Like, it's your turn, it's my turn. It's your turn, it's my turn. So they have a visual of maybe the tennis ball going over the net or the volleyball. But it's really a great thing to put the visual in their head and because you're also practicing week times that Chris was mentioning. Um, and using full sentences instead of the, the someone was sending me the I don't know, I think it was Zoe. I don't know. Um, well, they do know. And you just want to be able to maybe give them those words to practice ahead of time and just look at them. You know, make sure that they're looking at you and you're looking at them when you're having a conversation. And they love to ask those questions, so that's a great thing to do, is to answer those questions in full sentences and have them mimic that as well. Um, and one of the other things, it's like reading um, with them when you're um, chatting it up. One of the easiest genres to chat it up about are fairy tales, folk tales, nursery rhymes, 
because there's always, there's always great characters, of course, but there's a great lesson learned. So just to know that there is this quote that they say is that the truth is classical fairy tales make us better people. Um, they help us become resilient, kind, and even more intelligent. So I think that if you would like some motivation or inspiration is to go sit with some fairy tales and start reading them and then you really do see the power struggle in the book, the good versus evil, and it's really easy to say what the problem is um, for your child. So practicing retail and such. And then one of the last tips is playing with language. When the child goes to read or write, they love, we want them to notice the author's craft. We want them to notice what kinds of words are on the page, and they love silly words. They love words, um, rhyming words. Those are early literacy foundational skills like wiggle, niggle, jiggle, pickle. You can make them up and you know that it's just going along with helping them sing and say their nursery rhymes, um, making lots of fun things up. They like to act it out. So first and foremost, read aloud to your child every day. Thank you very much. And now I'm gonna pass it over to, thank you. <laughs> I'm going to pass it over to Jen Ponte. She is our K-8 math curriculum coordinator. Good morning, everyone. Um, like Zoe said, the kindergarten class is kind of the most exciting place to visit. I mean, eighth grade has its own special appeal, but watching kindergartners do math is always super exciting. And Chris actually set up a kindergarten math class quite nicely because there's a lot of things that <coughs> kindergartners are working on um, with turn taking and sharing and problem solving and all of those things of learning to be a student really is supported in the math class and we call it math workshop because they're really working hard on a lot of things. Um, and one of the big things that happens in the first couple months of kindergarten are working with counting and counting is more than just one, two, three, that's a piece of it, but there's so much more to counting that kindergartners work on. So when you think about your interactions with your children now, um, you're, you're doing a lot already, you probably don't even realize that it's actually a um, piece of the math curriculum. So when you talk about rope counting and the patterns of how we say numbers, that's a big piece to work on. So one, two, three, just that sound and sequence numbers is important. Um, it's also interesting to go backwards too. If you're counting down, watching the microwave go backwards. Let's, let's see the patterns of numbers as we go backwards, being flexible there. And what happens if you start counting and you don't start at one? What if we start at three and keep counting? That's always interesting to see how kids handle that and that's something that's so easy as you're walking and talking or sitting in the car. And always pausing as you cross over what happens from 1920, 29, 30. Like a lot happens when you cross those decades that is mind blowing to a lot of kids and you always see that pause. But just that routine of counting is interesting. Beyond just the sound of counting, it's objects that you're counting. So think about when you're cleaning up your toys, you're cleaning up your cars. Can we count how many there are? And think about modeling what organized counting looks like. That it's not just a jumble, but I'm counting every object once and I'm moving it to the side. And it's important that every object only gets counted once. Um, a lot of kids build this and develop it and teachers model it, but just the idea of putting items in a row and counting as you go. Touching as you go, super important. Will I get the same um, count if I count in the opposite direction? That's super important as well. Will I get the same count if I start in the middle and go to the end and then finish up at the start? Those are all things that kindergarten teachers focus on in the first months of the year and things that you're doing right now, but that you might want to just think about pointing it out in your questioning to your child. The other thing is counting quantities um, if you're asking your child to get something. So not just always presenting objects to count, but um, 
you know, Georgia, can you get me three spoons? And watch what happens. Does she go to the drawer and grab a handful and bring it to the table? Or is she thinking of what, what three means and picking up three as she counts them for the purpose of that collection? So that's always interesting as well. When you're playing games with your kids, think about how they move along the game board. That moving your marker one piece at a time, one square at a time, that's, that's important. Thinking about what Chris said about turn taking, that's important as well. But just that idea of that organized count is an important piece that we work on. And then just looking around of where numbers are. I'm looking at signs where I see numbers four, a two, and an eight. Um, looking at phones, um, looking at different things just for number recognition. Um, to attach a name to a written number, those are things to point out as well. And finally, just being curious and being problem solvers. Um, if you're sorting objects, an important part of math isn't just counting and calculating, but communication has become so um, such a big emphasis of our work that that problem solving and being able to explain to someone else why you did something or why does this pile have more than this other pile when we're comparing? Being able to talk about math um, is almost as important as computation um, in the math class. So just having those discussions about sorting some items based on a characteristic or an attribute, those are things that are important as well. And that'll definitely transfer to what you start seeing when they enter the math class in the fall. So we're excited to have your children, we're excited for the fall, and I hope those couple suggestions give you an idea of what to look at when you answer that. Thank you. Thanks, Jen. So you've heard a lot today. Um, we are excited to have your children come here. We know you're getting excited. Um, continue to just encourage your child's independence. I know that can be hard. You, it's hard to let go, but they really want to be independent too. So giving them appropriate opportunities for that. Um, the idea that there sometimes might be different rules in different settings is always helpful, and I'm sure they're experiencing some of that already in preschool. Another um, just invitation to all of you is go to your, your elementary schools in the, on the weekends, in the summer, vacation times, you know, school vacation times, and use the playgrounds. Um, it really is helpful for a young child to feel confident on that playground because they know that every day they're going to be outside playing and so if they feel comfortable and confident that's going to support that transition and it also helps them feel like it's their school um, so during our school hours school days um, we're able we're not able to have you visit then um, just for safety and supervision of the students who are here but certainly the weekends after school um, and over the summer please make a point to, to do that and just be excited with your child Okay, the registration process is beginning. Hopefully you've all been pre-registering already. Did want to just point out, in case you were not aware, that there was a change in our state, um, state legislation this year that shifted the entry date or birth date for kindergartners uh, to require that students are five years old by September 1st. So um, that we, we know may be surprising for some families. So here in our district, we have a Board of Education policy that if you are a family who has a child whose birthday is between September 1st and December 31st, so they'll be turning five after they would have started kindergarten. For this upcoming school year, um, we do have a process where if you would like your child to be able to still attend kindergarten, that you would send an email or a letter to your building principal to myself, Matt Kazkak, Jan Murphy for West, um, requesting that your child be able to attend kindergarten despite their birth date being in that September to December window. And then we will reach back out to you. We would ask that you come and, and we'll just have a, a meeting. You can bring your child um, there as well. We review the developmental milestones. We just want families to um, understand our kindergarten program and be sure that it is a match at this time for your child um, when they are maybe that little bit, bit younger. So we're happy to work with families on that, but please just reach out to your building principal to um, indicate that. Um, but then you're registering for kindergarten, so that happens online first. You go to the district website, uh, there's a pre-registration form right on the main webpage. We do have laptops here today. We also have QR codes you can use for that. Um, so we encourage families to do that as soon as possible. It helps us 
to be monitoring enrollment, which helps us plan for sections and, and teachers for your child. You'll receive an email from the McKenna Public Schools, and Laura Walsh is over here. Uh, so it doesn't say Laura's name, right, Laura? It will say NCPS Register when they get that email? The email, yeah. yeah. So if you don't get one after you've completed the, the pre-registration form online, check your spam folder. Sometimes it will land there. But you should get an email that will give you information to log into PowerSchool and set up your portal uh, account there with information. That's where you're going to enter all of the information for your child to register, and then Laura will be back in touch because there's other documents that you'll need to, to send along and scan in. Um, Laura will walk you through all of that. That sets you up in our system so that we can be inviting you to other um, sessions that we have throughout the spring. We have an opportunity for parents to come to an orientation session at your child's school building. We then have a time in the spring where your child will come and have an orientation. So you want to get that pre-registration completed so you can be working through all the steps that make sure you get those invitations. There's also a health form that's to be completed. Um, I'm going to ask if did Janet Reed, our nurse supervisor, if she wants to say just a few words about that health form. Welcome. So this is in Connecticut known as the blue form. I don't care what color it is, but this is the health form, and this is an important, your, your physician will fill out pages two through four with the immunizations. That'll be uploaded um, to Laura, and she'll get it to the nurses. But page one is very, very important, because that's filled out by the parent and then signed. So we don't consider them complete without that page one. And we have registered nurses in each building, and we're here to partner with you for the to support the health and wellness of your child. So sharing any information about any underlying um, health concerns that you have with the nurses is so, so important. And we have on our website some important um, information about our policy about allergies and anything that um, you might have specific questions about your child. But thank you and welcome. We know that sometimes with insurance, you may not um, be able to take your child, say, for their next physical until later in the summer. That's okay. Do all of that other paperwork. Um, and often you can uh, just request the immunization forms, all that, from your, your physician and get that um, into our um, system and into the nurse in our school so that they can review that. Um, that's important to have the health form completed um, before August, um, but certainly you can go through with the rest of this registration before then. What will then happen later in the summer is you will receive information regarding your child's placement, who their teacher is, you'll receive bus information, you'll receive details about the first day of school, the way we structure that for kindergartners here um, in our PTCs. In all three buildings, we have very active, very welcoming PTCs with lots of fun activities to, to get the year started. So you'll receive all that electronically. Uh, so be on the lookout for that. And finally, we just want to leave you with some important dates, and uh, you can, you're welcome to snap these on your phone, take a photo, I'll step over to the side. Uh, and actually, as you're doing that, if you have written down any questions, and Zoe or Trish um, can be at the ends of the, the rows here, you can pass the cards down. We don't have a lot of time before our kindergartners are going to be coming in um, for lunch. As you're taking a picture of these, I'll explain what these dates are. Kindergarten parent orientation is held at each of our buildings in March, and you see the dates here. Let's switch over here. There's a morning for each of the buildings, east, west, and south. This is just for parents. You come and you'll learn about a day in the life of a kindergartner in each of our schools. So I invite you to come, have that opportunity, you can tour the building. Then there'll be a kindergarten student orientation. That will happen later in the spring. We'll email you a particular time and date for your child to come and be able to meet with members of the kindergarten team. They have a chance to read a story. They come in small groups um, so that they can really feel like this is their school. And then the first day of school is August 29th of 2024, coming up. Oh, well, we will look into that. And Check that out. I believe the dates, the March 25th and March 26th, is correct. The day of the week may not have been shifted. So if you're looking at that, it's the, in both East and South, I believe, are on the same day. That shouldn't be a conflict because if you're, you have a child entering East, you would also have a child entering South. And then the 25th is West. Thank you. 
We will post this also on the website, so I will update that before it goes up on the website as well. So we have some questions regarding some of our safety protocols. Um, just so you know, we have our campus monitors. We also have um, Officer Gibson right now as our SRO across the elementary schools. And we, as uh, Zoe was mentioning, we have crisis advisory boards, both district and building-based, who um, you are constantly meeting. I shouldn't say constantly, I guess monthly meeting. And then um, you know coming together to talk about what are our safety protocols in the district so that we can ensure the safety of your child. Uh, and we communicate more of that out as well at some of our kindergarten uh, parent sessions. Um, parents asking about sort of the work that we're doing around reading. And yes, we have a reading program where we have, um, in our kindergarten and first grade in particular, we have lots of work that's done in terms of their phonological, phonemic awareness, the phonics work, building those solid foundations that they then bring forward to, to grow their decoding skills, that act of figuring out what those words on the page are, um, so that then they can, can make meaning of, of the text and continue to really attend to the sounds first, then the print, um, and bring all that together in the reading that they do. Um, and again, those are all um, pieces that we'll go into more detail about at the parent orientations here. Okay. Um, we do have our kindergartners coming in in just about 15 minutes. They have an early lunch shift here and we need to give time for our custodians to bring tables in. So appreciate everyone's time here this morning. Uh, please be sure to register, take, make sure you have the curriculum coordinator brochures um, and we'll all be right out in the lobby if, if you have other questions for us. Thank you.